Welcome to your Kingdom and Amelia lecture. So we're going to be talking about animals and um, animals are not just puppies and kittens and birds and the things that you um, you remember when or you think about when you hear animals. Animals are also things like the sponges down here um, or insects. Um, all of those things are animals. Um, what all animals have in common is that they're all eukaryotic, um, that they're all multicellular, they're heterotroph, which means they derive their energy from food, they all lack cell walls, and they have nervous systems. Some of them have rudimentary nervous systems, and one of my favorite nervous systems is the nervous system of, a, um, of an earthworm. Because in Germany, we call it literally, we call it rope ladders and uh, nervous system because it looks like a rope ladder. But when you look at the phylogenetic tree of the kingdom, kingdom animalia, um, you've kind of seen one of those before. Um, when you look at them, there are, um, there's an evolution and diversification that happens from a common an ancestor. Um, and it reflects niche preferences. There's a typo there. Um, in in um, some of these cases, it's the, um, this is based on the expression of homeotic genes that influence body plans. But basically what you see happening is that there are, um, let's call them inventions, um, that happen at these branch points where there's some animal um, developed true tissue, um, whereas some others didn't. And the periphera, um, they're still around even, so they were successful. So something about their niche allowed them to still stick around, um, whereas others, you know, found a different niche, found a different way. Um, so this is not an improvement, right? This is just the exploration of different niches um, and different things, um, became just a common feature of, of um, the animals that, that um, come later, that are the, the, um, the, the descendants, <laughs> the opposite from an ancestor, the, that are the descendants of this, um, of this common ancestor. Um, we're over here, uh, and we're gonna run that whole gamut from everybody um, from the periphera, we're going to look at well, we're going to look at pictures of periphera. Uh, you're going to see an example of a cnidarium. You're going to see an adorable platyhelminthes, uh, nematodes, mollusks. We'll see an annelid, um, arthropods, echinodermata, um, and then the chordata, which is us. So. One of the things I found was that it was difficult for students to um, remember who was what. And um, so it helps me um, to try to remember what some of these words mean and where they're coming from. So periphera, for example, those are the poor bearers. Um, and I need to change the spelling on these things. Um, Nidaria have stinging cells. Uh, Platyhelminthes are the flatworms, and platyhelminthes kind of sounds like helminth. That's a that's a worm, and platy that sounds sort of like flat, right? Um, nematoda are the thread-like roundworms. That's what nem nematoda means. Mollusca mollusk means thin shell. Um, those are the snails. Annelida those are the little rings. Those are the segmented worms. Arthropoda means jointed foot. Um, those are the ones with the chitin exoskeleton. And then the echoderma, echinodermata, those are the ones with the spiny skin. Those are your starfish and that kind of stuff. And then the chordata, those are the ones with the spinal cords. So one of the examples we're gonna be looking at, and you've seen a dead one before, but this time we're gonna look at a live one, um, is from the phylum Nidaria, uh, Hydra. Um, they're, they have radial symmetry in their body form, they're multicellular. Um, members of that uh, phylum are corals, sea anemones, jellyfish, etc. 
They don't have an internal um, so coelom, um, meaning that they don't have a, 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 a real body cavity. Um, some of them seem to. There's been some research that was done in the last year or two um, that makes that that where it looks like. Um, so they have a mouth, right, and the food goes in, and the, the exit is at the same place. Um, but it looks like some species of that uh, of Hydra actually have an exit pore, like an anal pore down here, um, that seems to not be um, existing at all times. But you could see how having an entrance and an exit could be very good for natural selection, right? Um, because there are certain dangers as you're, you know, exiting and entrancing for the same for the same food. It could it, a body plan that has an entrance and an exit um, could have advantages over a body plan that uses the same entrance for you know for the waste and for the input of the food. Um, you can get more input in if the exit is someplace else, for example, right? So that's more efficient for your for your food consumption. Um, so they they look like they're just at the um at the cusp of of um where a body cavity happens um where where an exit happens right there um the example we're going to use is hydra hydra is a medusa or a polyp uh, so the polyp form is the is the form that's that's with the arms um the medusa is the the, the other form um, they have nidocytes. Uh, nidocytes are these little things. Um, these little things are um, basically stinging cells, um, and they're used to capture prey. These are the reasons why um, jellyfish sting you or you know hurt you. Um, the, they contain neurotoxins, and if if this gets disturbed, then there's basically the, these barbs. They're shot out, um, and they deliver a neurotoxin, which is why you know. Um, jellyfish things are so um, so painful. Um, they can move by somersault locomotion, meaning that they kind of bend over and they, they basically take their legs, put, stick, pick their foot up, and then just keep on walking just like that. Um, the next one is platyhelminthes, and you'll see a video of that one. Um, the example we have is planaria. Uh, planaria actually can see light. Um, and it reacts to light. And there's a there's a video of an experiment that we usually do in the class uh, that I want you to watch. Um, it's also got these little ear flaps uh, that help him with um, like chemical sensing of, of things in the environment. Um, I think they look adorable uh, with those little cross-eyed eyes that they've got. They also have a very unusual digestive tract. They have on, on their belly, they have this pharynx like um, tube that they use to suck themselves to the food. Um, and then that's how they ingest their food. Um, they don't have an anus. Um, they live under rocks and in streams, streams, and they use cilia for locomotion. The annelids, those are the segmented worms. Um, they have repeated body segments that are called metamers. Uh, they do have a complete uh, digestive tract and a true coel coelom, uh, so a true body cavity. So there's an entrance and then there's an exit. Um, the example for those are leeches. Um, most leeches are carnivores. They'll eat insects and snails, so not bloodsuckers, but some of them are bloodsuckers. Um, the ones who are bloodsuckers, they, um, they inject an anticoagulant in you um, and an anesthetic uh, to make sure that you don't, you know, fight them. Um, and they're still used in medicine. So if you if you want to like um, start blood flow to an extremity, it's, it's very helpful to suck a leech on there because it's going to suck on one end and then hopefully you can get blood flowing uh, again. Uh, they live in freshwater habitats. And um, when we have classes, um, it's always interesting to see the leeches uh, because they're amazing. Uh, they can they the, the way they can change in size, they, they go from very short little things to these long, um, long worm creatures. And they always try to escape um, the, um, 
the container where students pick them up and then they get stuck on one of the uh, one of the instruments because they just, they suck themselves on there and then when the student wants to put it back into the into the water um the leech is not agreeing with that and they can hang on with both ends and so yeah there's a lot of a lot of times a lot of screaming going on when somebody's like i can't know what to do with that leech so it's 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 a fun lab i i miss the i miss the lab um the next thing we're going to do also this week is skull identification so um what i'm going to do is i'm going to give you I'm going to um, give you pictures of some skulls. Um, I'll, I'll have a walkthrough doing a, doing a skull identification with you first. And then I'm going to give you pictures of skulls with the identifying marks. Um, and then you're going to be able to, um, to hopefully identify the, the, the creatures that are in the pictures. Um, the types of things we use to identify a skull um, is one of the, one of the um, primary things we do is um, we identify teeth. Because teeth tell us a lot about an animal. Uh, the types of teeth an animal has tells us a lot about their diet. So if something has a canine, um, if something is a is a is um, something that hunts, um, it's usually got a canine, you know, a meat eater, um, and incisors that it uses to, to you know, cut things apart. Whereas a horse has a very different tooth because um, it's it's got a very different function. Um, so pay attention to that as you're identifying um, identifying these animals. Um, one of the terms that you're going to see a lot is the term diastema. It's that part, the part between um, the, the premolars um, and the incisors. There's a, basically a gap um, where there are no teeth. Um, and you'll be surprised how many animals have that. Um, you'll encounter one animal that literally doesn't have a teeth, uh, any teeth on the top. And that seems weird to us because we can't imagine being without teeth. But for them, obviously, it was a, an, an advantage because they're still around, right? Um, then we'll learn um, some terms about, um, about the skull. Um, the kinds of things that is, are going to show up a lot is the mandible and the maxilla. Um, there's uh, some uh, of the identification um, uses the nasal bone, um, the zygomatic arch, that's that arch right there, that's that bone right there, uh, that's brought up a lot. Um, in humans, this is a frontal bone, parietal bone, occipital bone, and this here's the temporal bone. Um, down here, this hole where your um, Spinal cord comes in, no, 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 vertebra, where your vertebra comes in, that's the foramen magnum. Now, some other words that you're going to be um, learning about is this section here, that's the rostrum, um, which is the from the end of the nose to basically the beginning of the orbit. And this here, where the eye is, that's the orbit. So these are the kinds of words you're going to see um, in the dichotomous key uh, that we're going to use to identify these animals. And I'm going to teach you how to use a dichotomous key. Um, I'm also going to ask you to create a dichotomous key because I think you have a different appreciation for what it takes to make one of those keys um, when you actually try to make one yourself. 